Hey, good morning, Northside. So glad that you chose to gather with us today. I would encourage you, um, if this is your first time with us or whether you're gathering with, you, with us each and every Sunday, if you'd go to our website at northsideac.org slash next steps, uh, there is an online form for, there for you to fill out. It lets us know you were here, but also gives you an opportunity to let us know of any prayer requests you may have. Um, or if you know what your next step may be, there's an opportunity for you to put that on there as well. Um, right now, we'd encourage you as you're sitting there in your living rooms or, or wherever you may be watching our service today, we'd encourage you to reach out to somebody digitally. Why don't you text somebody and let them know that you've missed them this Sunday. And um, just let them know that you've missed them. Let them know that you look forward to seeing them again uh, really, really soon. So just take a little bit of time to reach out to somebody digitally. As you're doing that, we'd remind you of our um, way to give online um, at Northside AC. Dot org slash give there you can give of your tithes and your offerings would encourage you to remain faithful in that you've been so faithful up to this point and um, because of that we've been able to meet so many different needs of people in our community as well as continuing to uh, support our missionaries abroad so we're so appreciative of that uh, so right now let me just um, encourage you uh, just to kind of begin to refocus your mind and your thoughts upon Jesus as we go into worship let me pray for you father I want to thank you uh, God, again, for this avenue that we have to gather online. And God, I pray that um, today, Lord, as we just seek to hear from you, God, I pray that we will learn how we can be overcomers today. God, I pray that as, as we go into our this time of worship, God, I pray that you will help us to truly honor you. God, as we go into the message here in just a little bit, God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Your name is great and your heart is kind. 
worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy name. Ice pieces broken and scattered. Mercy
Back in the 90s, um, there was this show called Fear Factor. And the funny thing about it was just the other day as I'm scrolling through Hulu looking for something to watch, I stumble across this show. They have it on Hulu and I began to watch some of the episodes and it took me back a little bit to when I used to enjoy watching the show. If you're not familiar with the show Fear Factor, it basically would get some contestants on the show and they would have different challenges to compete and they all had an idea had something to do with fear okay something that they may be scared of you know whether it was getting into a a pit full of snakes or whether it was um eating something gross or you know driving off of you know this ledge or whatever it may have been there was always something that had to do with fear and i can remember being a youth pastor in the late 90s and I'm dating myself a little bit here, but being a youth pastor in the late 90s and early 2000s, and there were several youth departments, and I did it myself, that instead of, we'd have theme nights, and instead of having um, fear factor, we'd have faith factor, right? Uh, so this is whole idea um, of fear over faith, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I've often said this about faith. Faith isn't the absence of doubt but rather trusting God in the midst of our doubt. I've also heard it said this way, faith is not the absence of fear, but faith is fear that has said its prayers. I love that. Uh, faith is fear that has said its prayers. Um, I'm reminded of a, of a man named Charles Blunden. Some of you may be familiar with him. He was the tightrope walker who crossed Niagara Falls several times. And he is crossing over Niagara Falls. And of course, the crowd is into it. They're eating into it just like anybody would do today. When you see somebody try something scary or death-defying, you just can't help but want to watch, right? And so they're watching and they're applauding. And, and he looks at them and says, how many of you feel like I could take this wheelbarrow and cross over Niagara Falls with somebody inside the wheelbarrow? And of course, everybody applauds and cheers. And yes, yes, you can. You definitely can. And then he simply asks this question. He'll be the first man to get into the wheelbarrow. Well, of course, the people, the story goes that everyone went silent. We know this about faith. Faith requires action, doesn't it? David Jeremiah said, A lack of faith is seldom a matter of disbelief. It is usually a matter of fear. So many times when we encounter faith and we talk about faith and we think of someone who lacks faith, we immediately go to disbelief. But many times it's not really a matter of disbelief. It's not the fact that we don't believe in God or that we don't believe that God will do this or God will do that. I, I really believe it's, for many of us, it's a matter of fear. We're scared. We're nervous. We don't know how it's going to turn out. So this fear begins to paralyze us. So today we're going to talk about how we can overcome fears with faith. And that's how we can be an overcomer today. Ephesians chapter 6 has been our, our kind of our theme passage throughout this throughout this series of being an overcomer Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 it says therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all this take up the shield of faith in which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of the Romans were typically about four feet tall, two and a half feet wide. They were extremely important because the enemy would take arrows, 
and they would sometimes dip them in poison or they would light them on fire and they would shoot them at the Roman army. So these, this shield was a vital part of their armor. See, and it's no different for us today. Our enemy shoots darts at us, doesn't it? Sometimes those are darts of doubt or despair or lies, anxiety, which we talked about last week, learning to overcome our anxiety and worry with, with peace. Sometimes it's confusion. Sometimes it's temptation. Next week, we're going to talk about how we can overcome our confusion with wisdom. And then we're going to talk about how we can overcome temptation with scripture. And, and faith is essentially how we overcome all of these things that the, the enemy would, would attempt to throw at us. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4 says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. So the question is, what is faith? Well, we know that faith is more than just belief. I mean, Jesus himself said, even the demons believe and they tremble. Kent Hughes said, faith is belief plus trust. We know that faith always has some action involved in it. Dr. Martin Luther King said, faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. I love that idea that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase. And we talk about next steps a lot here at Northside. And I'm always encouraging you to take your next step. And here's sometimes the, the problem with, with taking next steps is we often don't see several steps ahead. And we want to be able to see several steps ahead. We want to be able to see the big picture. But faith is truly taking that next step, even when you don't know what is quite ahead of you. Even when you can't see the whole staircase, it's taking the first step step. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, the faith shows the reality of what we hope for and is the evidence of things we cannot see. Proverbs chapter 3, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Faith is the willingness to trust even when we can't see. And it's obviously easier to walk by sight than it is by faith, isn't it? But let's be honest, we practice faith each and every day. This morning, this morning, many of you practice faith. You didn't think you did, but you did. When you got up this morning and you turned on your coffee pot, you didn't check to see if there was a frayed wire. You didn't check to see if there was any electrical issues. You just flipped on your coffee pot. You had faith that it was going to work and it was going to deliver the coffee that you needed to get through this morning. Then when you grabbed your coffee and you went to your living room and you sat down in your chair, you sat down in your couch, you didn't inspect your chair or your couch to make sure that it would hold you up. You just had faith that it would. A little bit later on today, when you realize that you're out of coffee and you're going to need coffee for tomorrow morning and you're going to go to the store to buy coffee and you're going to turn your vehicle on, you're not going to flip open the hood and check and make sure everything is exactly the way it needs to be. You're not going to check your lug nuts and make sure that they're all tight. You're just going to simply get in your car, you're going to turn it on, and you're going to back out of your driveway, and you're going to go to the store. We exercise faith on a daily basis. But when it comes to our faith, we really, especially in regards to spiritual terms, we want the whole picture. We want to see everything, and God very seldom works that way. But what God often does is God reveals one step at a time. And as we take that step, he reveals our next step. And then as we take that step, he reveals the next step. So we know faith to be important. And we realize that we need a strong faith to overcome the different fiery darts that the enemy will throw at us. So the question is this, how do we strengthen our faith? How do we grow in our faith? How do we grow our faith, right? How do we have the, well, let me ask you this. Have you ever seen somebody you've interacted with maybe at church or throughout your life, and they just seem to be so full of faith. You look at them and you're like, man, if I could have a faith like that, I wish that I could have a faith like that. I, I, there's been several men in my life that I look at and I still look at today, and, and I want to have a faith like that. So the question is, how do we grow our faith? Does it just happen organically? Does it just happen naturally? Or is there some things that we can do to help grow our faith? First one is this, number one, to grow our faith, we need preaching. Hearing God's word is so vital to our growth as a believer. It's so important, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a preacher and I like to preach. I know in my own life, 
hearing God's word from somebody else is so vital. It's vital to my growth. And But here's the thing. Rarely do I get to sit underneath preaching. Very rarely do I get to sit underneath God's word and, and listen to preaching. Because typically on most Sundays, I'm preaching. You know, there, there's, been, there's fellowship meetings that I get an opportunity to go to throughout the year. And as I go to those, I sit and I'm able to listen to, to other pastors preach. And it's so good for me. It encourages me. Even during this COVID-19, I've been able to listen to some friends of mine who are pastors because everyone's got their services online and, and I've been able to listen and to watch them preach and it's, and it's been such an encouragement to me. But we need preaching. Preaching helps to grow our faith. As we hear God's word, it helps to spur us on to action and to grow our faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So it says that faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through, through the word about Christ. So it's this whole idea is our faith has grown as we listen to God's word, as we listen to preaching. So as we hear the message, we hear preaching, but here's the thing, we still have to apply what we're listening to. Okay, you can, for example, you can sit in a sermon, or you can sit in a church service and hear a sermon and walk away and your faith hasn't grown, right? And many times the reason that happens is because we haven't applied what we've heard. We haven't applied what that pastor or what that preacher has said to our lives in a very practical manner. So that's the key. We have to hear preaching, but then we have to apply what we're listening to. Remember what the book of James said? It says, don't just be hearers of God's word, but be doers of God's word. James says this, just don't listen to preaching, right? Just don't listen to God's word, but do what it says. Apply it to your life. So we need preaching. Number one, we need preaching to help us grow. Number two, to grow our faith, we need problems. Now this one's difficult. Tim Keller said this, believers understand many doctrinal truths in the mind but those truths seldom make the journey down to into the heart except through disappointment, failure, and loss. As a man who seemed about to lose both his career and family once said to me, I always knew in principle that Jesus is all I need to get through. But you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Our faith grows when we encounter problems. To grow our faith, we need problems. Problems can be a huge catalyst for our faith because many times those problems have the tendency to drive us to our knees and push us closer to God. I do know this personally. My prayer life is better when I'm struggling. My prayer life is better when I'm encountering some sort of problem that I can't get out of myself. My prayer life is just better. My prayer life isn't as good when things are going well. Why? Because many times I don't think I don't think to pray, right? It's just that's kind of the normal tendency. But many times when problems of life hit, we immediately begin asking people to pray for us or we seek out prayer, we pray ourselves. But also notice this, when we've encountered problems, we have a choice. It can push us closer to God or it can drive us further away from God. And as a pastor, I've seen both. Even as a pastor of this church, I've seen people encounter problems and I can remember just in my first three or four months here at the church as the pastor, there were several people who encountered just life-wrenching and life-changing issues and problems in their life. And for some of them, I saw it push them closer and closer to God. But for others, I saw it drive them further and further away from God. And, and ultimately, we have a choice in that of how we're going to handle that problem. And this coronavirus and COVID-19 has, has presented a huge problem for us all, and in different ways. For some of us, it's presented problems financially. Some of us, it's presented problems of just fear and anxiety. For some of us, it's presented problems of anger and bitterness and, and frustration. But this coronavirus has presented problems for us all. But my prayer is that as these problems have come, that you've allowed it to push you closer and closer to God. As you find yourself struggling, maybe financially, 
my prayer is that you look to the God who is a God of all provision. As you find yourself just facing the problem of worry and anxiety, my prayer is that you've looked to the one who can give you ultimate peace. As you, as you face the problems of anger and bitterness and just frustration over this, my prayer is that you look to the one who can provide ultimate understanding and give you ultimate wisdom through this. That's what our problems do. Our problems can push us closer and closer to God. I know nobody wants problems. We all would want to live a problem-free life, right? That would be wonderful. But look what James says. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let me ask you this question. Is your goal to get out of your problem or to get something out of your problem? I want to say that again. Is your goal to get out of your problem or to get something out of your problem? See, it's all about our focus, isn't it? It's all about our focus when it comes to our problem. Is, is our goal is, God, just get me through this. God, just get me through this. Lord, take this away from me. Or is our focus, God, teach me something through this. God, you tell me in James to count it all joy when I encounter problems and trials. God, that's difficult for me to do. So, God, I'm asking you that you teach me something. Teach me perseverance, God. Teach me patience. Teach me something through this trial and through this problem. So when it is gone, I'm better then than I was before. Our problems can teach us so much. And James tells us when our faith is tested, we become mature and we become complete. So in order to grow, we need preaching. We also need problems. But number three, to grow our faith, we need people. Christianity was never meant to be done alone. This is a team sport. We need each other. We were never meant to live in isolation. We need each other. I'm showing a picture up here on the screen of a Roman shield. And if you look to see when they all get into formation and they link their shields together, each person is protecting each other. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. People make us better because they see things that we don't. So I talked last week and just shared a little bit about some of my struggles over the past couple weeks and just dealing with some anxiety and different things like that. I do know this, my wife sees that coming before I do. My wife sees those things coming in my life before I do. We desperately need people. And as a church, we need each other. I know we're still hearing God's word. We still get the opportunity to worship, even though it's different. Sometimes it may seem odd to sing in your living room, but we're still getting the opportunity to worship. We're still getting the opportunity to hear God's word. We still have the opportunity to give, but we're missing the interaction with people. We need each other more now than ever before. There are so many, I've been talking with several pastors and, and we're seeing this uptick in a lot of addictions and vices right now during this COVID-19 and it's because people are idle. And many times people find themselves more alone now than they are before. So they're, they're finding um, fulfillment in some different addictions and vices. We need each other, church. We desperately need each other. That's why I encourage you to contact people. Let them know that you miss them. We need one another. Just this past Tuesday night, I was just having a difficult time. And I had another brother in Christ that came to my house and just prayed for me. They just prayed for me. And he chatted with me a little bit, but he was there. And it showed me how much that even me, myself as the pastor, how much I need people. We need each other, church. 
we need each other to grow. If we're going to grow in our faith, we, we need preaching. We need problems, but we also need people. Number four, to grow our faith, we need purpose. To grow our faith, we need purpose. I've spoken to so many people, and I've heard this often from people. I, I want purpose in life. I, I want to feel like I have a purpose. People don't like to feel like they're purposeless, okay? They don't want to feel like they just wake up, go to work, and come home and, and repeat that cycle over and over again. They want to feel like there's purpose in their life. But let me tell you what Scripture says. Psalms 139, verse 14. It says, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He planned for us long ago. The Bible is very clear. You're not here on accident. You have a purpose set forth for you before you were even born. And this purpose was laid out by God himself. You see Ephesians, remember what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says? It says you are God's masterpiece. Think about that for a moment. You are God's masterpiece. Now I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror every day, I don't see a masterpiece, right? When I look in the mirror, I see, I see several different things I'd love to change about my appearance. Things I'd love to change and things that I wish were different. I don't see a masterpiece, but Ephesians chapter 2 tells me that I am God's masterpiece. And when you're a masterpiece, it means you're the greatest work that artist has ever done. You're the greatest. Okay, you're their crowning achievement. This kind of hit me like a ton of bricks just a couple years ago when my family had the opportunity to visit the Grand Canyon. And as I stood and looked at the Grand Canyon, just in awe of God's creation, right? In awe of God's creation. Before Beck and I got married, had the opportunity to go and, and visit Hawaii with her family. And, and I was just in awe of God's creation. The Grand Canyon, Hawaii, the Rocky Mountains, the beautifulness of Colorado, you name it. Name anything that God has created. Of all those things, he doesn't say, this is my masterpiece. He says, you are my masterpiece. You're my greatest work. You're my greatest achievement. You are my masterpiece. See, he's created you for a purpose to do good work. So don't ever feel like you're insignificant. Don't ever feel like you don't have a purpose because you do. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 reminds us of that, that we are God's masterpiece and He created us long ago for, for a purpose and for a plan. God has a purpose for our life. See, I've often heard it said this, we serve an amazing God and our God doesn't make junk. Fear is a real thing and faith is what helps us to overcome our faith, but we need a growing faith. We need for our faith to grow. And I think this is where many of us get tripped up. We feel like our faith is just too small. We feel like our faith isn't large enough or we're not, we don't have enough faith. We feel that it's small. We feel that it's insufficient. And we just don't know what to do. We read a verse like the faith is size of a mustard seed can move mountains. And all that does is discourage us because we know we haven't rearranged the landscape in our life. So we keep thinking, man, my faith isn't even as big as a mustard seed. My faith is so insufficient. Let me tell you this. It's not the size of our faith. It's whom we're putting our faith in. It's not the size of our faith that matters. It's whom we're placing that faith and trust in. And we know that as we put our faith and trust in God, He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. We know that He is there. And we know that He has a plan for us. We know that He calls us His masterpiece. We know that He has a purpose for our life. We know that He tells us we're significant. We know that He has 
just an amazing things he wants us to do. So it's not the amount of faith that we have, it's who we're placing our faith in. So as we shift our focus from a lack of faith to God himself, we'll find and we'll see that our faith grows. See, so many times our focus is placed on what we perceive to be a lack of faith. When we need to switch our focus to God and we need to keep focusing in on God and take whatever faith we have, right? You remember, you remember the Roman soldier whose son was sick and he asked Jesus, will you heal my son if you can do anything? And Jesus says, if I can do it, I'll do it for someone who believes. And what, what did the soldier say? God, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. He's simply saying, God, I believe, but I'm having some doubts. God, I believe, but I'm struggling right now. God, I believe, God, I have faith, but I just need your help. God, I have faith, help me to put my faith and trust in you. So church, let us not worry about what we perceive to be a lack of faith. See, because many times we see a lack of faith and then our fear begins to overcome our faith. We need to understand it's not about the amount of faith that we have, but it's who we're placing our faith in. So we take our, our faith, whatever little faith we have, and we place it in Jesus Christ. And then we're able to overcome the fears that we encounter in our life. So to grow in our faith, we need preaching. We need to hear God's word, but we also need problems. We need to be tested. We need to be stretched because those problems push us closer and closer to God. We desperately need people. We need people in our lives to help us, but we also need purpose. And as our faith grows, we can become overcomers. Psalms chapter 56, verse 4 says, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Listen to this again. In God I trust and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? It's, the psalmist is saying, God, I put my trust in you and I have no fear. Because what can anybody do to me that, that can hurt me at this point? Because God, I place my faith and my trust in you. One next step I want you to think about. Just one question before I close this in prayer. In what ways do you need to take a step of faith today? How do you need to take a step of faith today? In what ways do you need to take a step of faith? Where is God calling you to take a step? Maybe some of you, he's calling you saying, hey, I need you to trust me with your finances. Trust me with your finances. Trust me with your finances, and I promise I'll provide. For some, maybe he's saying, hey, I need you to trust me with your kids. I know it's hard, but trust me with your kids. Trust that I have a plan for them. Maybe for some of you, God is saying, I need you to trust me with your marriage. I know you feel like it's not going anywhere, but trust me. Trust me with your marriage. Maybe for some of you, it's just simply, he's calling you to trust him with your life saying trust me as your savior stop trying to do life on your own and trust me as your savior in what ways is god calling you to take a step of faith today let me pray for you dear god that i've resonated so much with this sermon today and this idea of overcoming fear with faith and God, I pray that you speak to each one of us, God. I pray you'll show us what our next steps are. God, show us what steps of faith that we need to take in our life. And God, when you reveal those things to us, God, give us the courage to take that step. God, give us the faith that it'll take to take that step. God, I thank you for this series and how we're learning to be overcomers. God, continue to speak to us continue to do amazing things in our midst. Lord, we love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Northside, it's Amy. Welcome to week nine of online church. I'm ready for it to be over, 
But we would love to hear from you. So if you'll go to our website, www.northsideac.org, there you'll find a connection card. On it, you can give us your next steps, your prayer requests, your praises, or just let us know that you were here today. Also, it continues to be important to give our tithes and offerings. So if you'll go to our website, www.northsideac.org slash give, or on our app, you can give electronically. You can mail your check-in, you can bring it up to Becca, whatever you need to do. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week.